That is my understanding. So hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, we are one of the breakout sessions going on and focused on roads and transportation. And we have an esteemed group of people who are specialists in this area who are going to help give us some information about their backgrounds to start and then answer some key questions about infrastructure funding. So I'm going to start and I'll, I'll go around the room and just circle. Um, Laura, if you could please describe your background um, and what you do, please. Of course, uh, Laura Wagner Bartz. Um, I manage a section around asset management and resiliency at HNTB. My background's in civil engineering. Fantastic, thank you. Trisha, if you can give some information about yourself, please. Sure, hi, nice to see everybody. My name is Trisha Stefanski. Um, I work in our asset management program office as well as Metro District Maintenance um, at the Minnesota Department of Transportation. And if Trisha looks familiar, it's because she was presenting a few minutes ago. <laughs> so you get your second opportunity to spend time with Trisha. Magdi, if you can introduce yourself, please. Yeah, Magdi Mikhail, Senior Manager with the Agile Assets at Trimble Company for Transportation Industry Solutions. Uh, I supervise product owners group. And prior to joining Agile Assets, I was the state pavement engineer for the Texas Department of Transportation. Fantastic. Thank you, Maggie. Linda, could you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Thank you. I'm Linda Rolfus. I work with HNTB. Um, I've got a background in application development and, uh, and uh, configuration. For the past 20 years, I've worked with HNTB to uh, set up either build or buy configuration, uh, sorry, collaboration platforms for major programs across the country. Thanks, Linda. Eric, could you introduce yourself, please? Yes, hello, uh, Eric Bloom with HNTB. I'm our project and program controls practice leader at HNTB, so I work with both our clients across the country as well as our teams internally to uh, roll out best practices around uh, project controls. Fantastic, Eric, thank you. And for those of you who didn't happen to see the main session a few minutes ago, I'm Jamie Cook. I work for Trimble PPM in the construction sector. So welcome again. And I want to start with a general question for each of you. Um, I guess starting with you, Laura, how has infrastructure funding impacted your work? Well, right now, the, the IIJA bill has not yet affected most of the clients I work with. There's just a lot of preparation thinking about how are we going to prepare for that money coming in? What can we do to position ourselves to be able to intake it and um, allocate it appropriately and not waste the money. But so far, there's not really a lot of actual projects or initiatives around um, around that funding. So a lot of planning, but the actual mm -hmm. work hasn't begun yet, at least in your experience with your Yes, clients. that's the case. Fantastic. Trisha, what about you? Yeah, I think, um, you know, like you're saying, we really have been planning um, for kind of the decisions that need to happen, the stakeholders that need to come together. Um, I just was thinking back to 2012 in the asset management world when MAP 21 legislation was passed and it feels so similar. Um, it was like, where are we going with this? What do these requirements mean? You know, um, a lot of ambiguity, I think, but really kind of trying, I think MnDOT right now, we're really trying to set up these decision-making groups um, create program goals and priorities and support development of those systems. Um, specifically, I can say the things that I've been involved in and look forward to talking more about this, but um, I'm a member of two new committees um, that have been created on sustainability and resiliency. And then, as I said in our last se session, we are just implementing an extreme flood vulnerability tool and some process development around flooding. Um, and then we're identifying slope vulnerability locations. So I was involved in that project. And then the one that I'm kind of really interested in on the data side is we're developing resilience performance measures. Fantastic, that sounds really exciting. Magdi, I'll ask the same question of you. How has it yes. impacted your work right now? So we're looking at how our asset management products can help agencies address the new requirements for the bill. Things like diversity, equity and inclusion or resiliency. 
we want to make sure that the agencies that are using uh, our products are able to address the requirements in the bill. That's huge. As we mentioned before, the compliance requirements and the prioritization of projects based on how much positive impact you have um, is going to be critical both to be able to track and to be able to report on. So that's great, Maggie. Thank you. Linda, how has it impacted your work? Well, I'm going to echo what Laura said. Um, it is all, all about planning, um, trying to make sure that our clients of all sizes are ready for that tsunami of work that's going to show up, you know, and, and you know, from my standpoint on a collaboration platform, trying to make sure that uh, things are getting stress test and thought through uh, before the work hits. Fantastic. And Eric, how has it impacted your work? Uh, yes, I again, similarly, uh, a lot of folks um, uh, planning, trying to understand, um, you know, kind of you know, what what are the provisions of the bill, you know, how the regulations be written to better understand those products that will, will likely be eligible and or most likely to kind of uh, get into the get in the window, the funding window. Uh, and and I think in preparation for that, in some cases, we have clients who are thinking about, you know, upgrading and or um, uh, adding to their capabilities around kind of core project management capabilities. Fantastic. And while we have you focused, Derek, I'm going to switch to a, a different angle. What challenges do you find people are facing with, with the magnitude of the funding or the timing or you know, delivering real value from the funding itself? Yes. Uh, you know, I think probably a couple of things there. Uh, but um, I, I think that um, number one, it's it's the challenge of, of uh, you know, getting that prioritized list of projects, um, uh, it, you know, dusting off either contemplated products that just didn't have funding before and, and then determining are those products that might be priorities for the agency, do they match with the, the targeted priorities um, that are you know enabled through the infrastructure bill, right? Um, and so there's that piece of it. I think a, another challenge is um, you know looking at um, trying to understand you know what what will become available um, you know given you know thing uh, some of the situations uh, like uh, the escalation uh, uh, we currently are experiencing in, in the global economy. And so you know what how far down the list are they going to be able to hit with their projects given um, escalation and, and factors and supply chain factors, what have you, uh, may, you know, pr certainly provide more products than they would otherwise have, but essentially at the same time may eat into some of the uh, available products that might otherwise get funding if you see it just kind of a overall cost growth uh, across the board. So some of it is managing and planning for the unknown or potential mm -hmm. fluctuations. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yep, I hear you. Fisher, has that been your experience? The, the challenge is realizing that you're still sort of in the the planning and organizing phases, but what challenges have you faced so far? Yeah, I think, um, you know, any new program, this one is just quite complex. And I was telling presenters yesterday, I was gonna do more homework, because when we talk about the challenges and we look at this bill, there's so many different um, items in it and so many different ways that maybe DOTs will wanna leverage the funds um, and the changes. So for us, I, I think, um, you know, really knowing what it means, having those leaders out there, those supporters um, that can lead the, the committees. So the two committees I'm on, the Climate and Resiliency Work Group, I've been really excited about that committee because we've brought in like all of our statewide partners. And I don't envy, again, this team lead because we're looking at determining um, funding distribution. <laughs> across uh you know this new money basically coming in so anytime you're distributing funding i mean it's not like my two kids right you each get a dollar um it really doesn't work that easily so i think just looking at that and within that climate and resiliency work group that we've created it actually has the carbon reduction program the electric vehicle program and the protect resiliency climate sub work group. So, you know, we're setting up this structure of um, getting information, getting feedback, and then making decisions. Um, so I think just having those right people in the meeting and then thinking about how we can get to this um, statewide funding distribution and meet the stakeholder needs, you know, we still want to be great partners. So it's just the beginning. That was our second meeting of that group. Um, and then I mentioned to Jamie, the resiliency advisory team, 
So that one we're trying to come up with, I think is today, June 1st. By today, we needed to come up with five to 10 climate resiliency performance measures. Um, and the challenge there was all the options and can we use the existing data that we have in the system? So we've really been digging into the data um, and looking at what, what exists. For example, flooding, you know, again, slope failures, things like that. And then how do we move forward in tracking new data and what are we looking at? Um, so those, yeah, those are some of the things. And then later I could talk to you about, again, the digital transformation and, and some challenges there. So Laura, when you give your children a dollar each, how much detailed reporting do they have to do on that, their expenditures? Uh, well, <laughs> they're pretty young, so I just can kind of fake out that I paid them and they don't remember. So uh, <laughs> I guess it works so well at the DOT level. Um, I, I, by the way, sorry, way. Trisha, I lo love that analogy. Thank you for letting me use it. <laughs> um, you know, but I'll... I'll I'll run with that a little bit is that yeah. it's, you know, there, there is that, that pot of money and how is it distributed? And you know, the, the prioritization measures are different now than they were, you know, two, five years ago, the IJA, we need to incorporate resiliency practices. What are those measurements? There's no standard guidance mm -hmm. for what those are, are supposed mm -hmm. to be. And I'll mention equity, you know, how do we make our transportation systems equitable? How do we, set up the measure to show that we're even meeting requirements. And and Trish said it's about, you know, stakeholder engagement and and understanding that it's it's somewhat of an arbitrary measure. Um, or at least it seems arbitrary now. So that's what we're working towards is, is something measurable to make sure that the the distribution of funds is equitable um, for for everybody. Got it. And Linda what challenges are you seeing? Um, yeah, I visited with some colleagues uh, about challenges they've been seeing across the board. And, and of course, the, the fuzzy rules and regulations, everybody's waiting for uh, the details. And, you know, from a technology side, you can't write a report if you don't know uh, what the criteria is or, or, you know, build a tool to, to specific rules. Uh, so that that's a challenge. Uh, the workforce shortage is not just in our, our client agencies, it's also in the A&E uh, firms, it's in construction, it's in the material suppliers. Um, so, you know, they're gonna have to meet the need in a very short time. Um, and so, you know, that's going to, to add stress to whatever technology tools we use to enable our, ourselves to, to get this work done. Um, and I, I like Trish's mention of the data, you know, big data has been with us for a little bit, but now it's really going to get leveraged in order to even uh, uh, be able to show that you qualify so, for some of this funding. And so it's going to be interesting to see how um, the data that's already been collected in the past is leveraged. And then it, it brings a new need for data at a greater scale going forward to, to prove that uh, you, you qualify and you're following the new regulations. So Linda, that's a great segue. You know, as much as this funding is going to create new projects, the projects themselves are going to require a level of administration and reporting that has never been um, required before and, and mm -hmm. arguably organizations might not be ready for. Mm -hmm. So Linda, building on that, we are fully expecting that the funding itself is going to increase people's workloads. And you talked about the data analytics piece of it. Is there anything else that, that from your perspective, is going to really make the workload harder for people in addition to the the actual projects being added? Well, I think the the amount of work that's going to have to be done in a short amount of time is unprecedented, along with the workforce shortage. Um, and so I feel like our agencies are going to have to be leaning on more outside support, more outside companies and are gonna to have to be able to knit this disparate group together in order to efficiently do the work. So, you know, from a project basis or a program basis, you're dealing with multiple cultures, multiple data sources. You're gonna to have to be able to, to pull all that together in a, an organized and managed way to, to deliver on these programs. So um, I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> You did. I mean, it's all those factors and everything that has to be considered. That's great. Eric, is there anything you want to add to that about the 
the impact on people's workloads and what they currently do and what they'll need to do to support the funding? Well, I, I, I would just um, probably echo what Linda said, but with a slightly different twist is in the bottom line is we know this is going to increase um, you know, workloads on in, in, in our clients and agencies across the country. So um, so in the transportation space, um, this is just going to have, a, you know, kind of a, a massive effect as the money gets into the pipeline here. It's just a matter of the timing of the, when that money comes in and how quickly it kind of uh, is accessible versus being released over, you know, staged over kind of a period of time. Uh, but um, it, it will increase in, in, in the number of products available to folks to, beyond what they would otherwise have. And uh, I think it's, um, certainly going to increase uh, in the space that we work in with clients, both in the design as well as the program management side of things, certainly going to increase their need for design services, preliminary design work, what have you, planning type work and, uh, and program management type work. So um, we're, we're excited to support our clients in this regard um, and to help them manage kind of a bigger workload um, with, with um, you know, better processes, uh, tools and, and um, you know, uh, kind of laser focus. That's fantastic. Thank you. Tricia, what's your take on the impact it's going to have on your workload? Yeah, I mean, I can talk about real specific things here. Um, I think on the people side, I, I really appreciate the equity piece of this. And I think when I look at a flowchart or like a, a diagram, you think of equity as kind of everywhere, right? Everywhere. It's that whole line kind of of all that we're doing. But I just had a presentation that I listened to at the Minnesota Transportation Conference from a friend of mine that was like instrumental. And so I just wanted to say a little bit about what he presented. Um, having hard conversations about equity, um, talking specifically, digging into prejudice and implicit bias, knowing that inclusion comes first, you know, talking about race, religion, gender, abilities, and just having a better understanding of each other. So I would like to you know, start there, um, start having those conversations within uh, within my own staff uh, and within our functional groups. I know MnDOT has several diversity mm -hmm. inclusion um, committees and really, you know, has strategies within each committee to really have more compassion and empathy for each other. So on the people side, I think that is something that no matter how much work you have, you really want to, you know, take some time to, to be uh, people centric. I also see within our staff, we have a lot of IT, embedded IT, we have a lot of GIS analysts. Um, we need those young generation of professionals, to the data scientists, the GIS analysts. We're gonna need more and more of those folks to come along with us, I think. Um, and then in the tools, you know, we have a Agile Assets or TAM system. And so we're looking at how can we incorporate more tracking, um, do more within our current systems to see emergency response. Yes, you know, I've talked about flooding, blow up, slope failure, failures. Um, and then our snow and ice operations. So I know New York would, they were sitting next to me. I get to sit next to them in a boat last week. Um, they would say the same thing. We're moving away from, uh, you know, rock salt usage, introducing more liquid de-icers. And we can do this all with technology. So we can do it by watching through our decision support system for maintenance, watching the use, and really, you know, being able to predict, I think, uh, what we should be putting on the roadways. Um, and lastly, our transportation asset management plan development. So that includes extreme weather and resilience. And specifically, that's something that I've helped to produce and work with that team and making sure that we're including the weather and um, resilience in the life cycle costs and risk management analysis. That's fantastic, Trisha. I'm going to uh, focus on one thing that you said in particular, that the diversity, equity, inclusion component, which arguably organizations have been doing of their own volition, you know, for a while, but now it's becoming part of a mandate. It's actually something you need to be doing and prove that you're doing. So those organizations that hadn't already built that into their work need to look at ways to do it and track and report on it. And Magdi, I know that's one of the things that you focus on is the ability to track and report on, on DEI. If you can give us more information about that, please. Yes, we're starting to think about this topic. So we need, you know, we're trying to look at generating reports or map that would look at how many projects are we generating based on, you know, 
uh, demographics or incomes. We'll look at the number of projects in a certain city or county based on income or demographics and also evaluate the performance of the, the assets in kind of uh, underserved areas. Has it been historically un below the desired level of service and compare it to other areas? And also you can use the analytical tools to develop kind of uh, projects to achieve certain levels of service in underserved areas or areas that have been underfunded to determine how much money is needed so that the level of service can reach a certain level in uh, underserved areas. And, you know, the new bill, you know, has a lot of, uh, you know, funding for addressing uh, equity and diversity. So, Matty, I mean, you made a really interesting point. It's not only the historical tracking of where you've impacted DEI, you're talking about proactive future planning so that funding and projects can be directed towards the maximum DEI benefit and yes. disadvantaged community benefit. That's, yes. that's fantastic. I'm really, really glad to hear that. While we have you focused, can you also talk about sustainability reporting? and environmental impact and how you can track and, and arguably plan around being able to report on that as well. So there is a lot of things that are involved in sustainability. You know, one of them is flooding and one of them is uh, reduction of uh, carbon emissions. So usually good roads provide good rolling resistance that reduce carbon emissions and also use of recycled materials will help also reduce of uh, carbon emissions and tracking the usage of uh, recycled materials and also design uh, kind of planning projects so that your roads are in good condition kind of uh, to reduce carbon emissions and nice dot is kind of leading this effort of determining how much the impact of improving the condition of the roads on carbon emissions. So all of these can be tracked and quantified to determine the impact. That's also, fantastic. Um, so Trisha, you mentioned the, the climate resiliency and the proactive work you're doing to be able to identify opportunities as well as, as track and report on them. Are you prioritizing the projects you're applying for funding based on the potential positive impact or the reduced negative impact that they'll have on the environment? Well, so I'm not, you know, programming, but I can say we have a scoring criteria for our projects. And so there's a lot of different criteria that we're using. And I do think there is an equity criteria and then there's a sustainability greenhouse gas reduction. If they don't have it already, they're working towards that. So absolutely, that will be a part of every project. Fantastic. And Laura, are you finding that with, with your clients, that they are actively seeking opportunities? Yes. So we're definitely seeing clients right where Trisha's at with creating those scoring mechanisms, fitting them into their pre-existing prioritization scores. How does that impact it? Um, you know, with the understanding that the prioritization for Seattle and their what they consider climate or extreme weather events and equitable distribution of funds is going to be a lot different than Minnesota or Texas. So it's just not a one size fits all. Um, so I'm seeing that even you know, like Trisha says she was talking to New York, there's a lot of we're hearing a lot of that and we're, we're helping put various clients in contact with each other when we're when we're hearing people talk about these these types of programs that they're they're starting um, just because of that the, the workforce issue is that sometimes there, there's just not enough time in the world for everyone to know what everyone's doing so whatever we Absolutely. can do to help those relationships is is always to benefit that's great and eric what's your experience been with, with clients and and how they're planning for and then measuring their impact on both the DEI or the, even the environment, either or. Yeah, certainly um, there's there's a lot of interest and, and a lot of focus on that. And um, you know, our experience has been that clients do want more refined ways of doing that. They're looking for uh, you know items like um, 
GIS or, or you know, kind of, uh, you know, geographic base capabilities to really reflect where they're making those impacts um, and, 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 and where the needs are. Right. So and, and the ability to convey that in a very effective, meaningful way, often you find it, it's about it's about the um, uh, the message and how that message gets across. And, and so we're working with clients a lot and seeing a lot of interest in how do I best convey that information in a way that really demonstrates how I'm meeting the needs of those communities and those geographic areas that, that have that demonstrated need. So That's fantastic. Magdi, I'm going to go back to you for a second. I know another area that, that you cover um, has to do with security and being able to um, identify and track, say, oh, sorry, safety and security. I guess safety is a better way to say it, safety requirements. Um, how do you, within your reporting tools, or how do you guide people in monitoring and measuring safety initiatives? Well, Safety is near and dear to the heart of everyone who works in the transportation. We have so many fatalities on the roadways and we need to kind of reduce or eliminate fatalities and reach the goal of zero death. And I think good asset management practices, if the road is in good conditions, if the signs are in good condition, if the drainage is good, that indirectly contributes to safety. And there is a lot of tools that agencies can use to kind of determine hot spots and areas where you have certain patterns of crashes and address these the causes for crashes. And there is a lot of funding in the bill for safety and the concept of safe, complete safe streets to kind of uh, address safety. That's fantastic. And we're going to take a, a different angle on safety. And I mentioned before security. So Eric, uh, uh, if you don't mind, if you could talk a little bit about how you guide clients in ensuring security in the work that they do, especially the sensitive work or the work that is the most vulnerable. Um, how, how do you help them to make sure that work is secure? Yes. Uh, so security, you know, has a lot of different, there's a lot of different uh, hats that security kind of can wear, so to speak. I mean, and, and, and oftentimes what we're seeing is safety and security really are, are kind of men, uh, mentioned uh, in the same sentence all the time now. They certainly are different, uh, but they're both vitally important. And the clients are understanding the security piece is becoming you know, much more important uh, in many ways. And this is not only site security, physical security, uh, security of the the vulnerable uh, aspects of assets, right? That need to be that design information needs to be protected, and, and better protected than maybe you know non-threatened uh, design aspects of, of facilities, right? Um, but the, the other piece that I'll, I'll, I'll take a moment to drill into is cybersecurity, right? Mm -hmm. um, because um, you know we, we know cybersecurity is is is, is a, a paramount issue um, that uh, you know hacks are happening and attacks are happening across the across the globe. Um, and and um, oftentimes for nothing more than just the, the ability to try and extract some some ransom from organizations that are crippled through a cyber attack, right? And so uh, we, we've seen you know across the board in the industry, our clients in particular, uh, really being vitally interested in um, how do I ensure I have the best cybersecurity practices in place? How do I harden my my uh, uh, assets, including you know the, the the necessity of really being in the cloud these days, right? And how do I harden that and kind of make the best approach we can um, to have robust practices in place? Train our employees, obviously, because there's a huge piece that's the 98% of all you know attacks happen through some human error kind of flaw on um, thinking this was a real link and not a, not a phishing link, so to speak, right? So all that stuff, we've seen just a massive influx and focus on. We're hopeful that, uh, you know, the digital transformation uh, funding, you know, supports that as well as it comes forward in the infrastructure bill. And that's, that's a great transition, Eric. Let's actually talk about that. So we talked about increased workload, increased demand, and we talked about the fact that the funding sources in the previous sessions come with digital transformation dollars and that with the right tools, the right technology, there's opportunity to better manage um, and better report on the work that's being done. So Laura, let me go to you for a second. Mm -hmm. Digital transformation funding and the opportunity to put the right technology in place in support of, of the use of the funding. Mm -hmm. 
can you talk a little bit about how clients are either currently or planning to leverage that technology? Yeah, I think there's a lot of interest, but there's also a lot of concern. And there, some clients are backpedaling and wanting to go back to what it, does their data governance strategy look like? kind of going back to how are we gonna handle all of this big data? Are we really prepared for everything that's coming in so that we can handle these 3D deliverables, 3D design, you know, the, the digital models to, to run the asset management practices, the live data coming in, um, just so many data sources and streams. So they're almost taking a step back into their, to their governance strategies and making sure that they are prepared to move forward correctly. So I, I hear what you're saying, and, and it's great that they're taking the step back to make sure they're, they're mm -hmm. structured and planning appropriately. My concern with what you're saying is that they're effectively going to delay the acquisition of the technologies they need until yes. time, because of yes. all this planning and preparation time in advance. Yes. How do you actually I, I stop that agree. from happening? So we, we need to, to make sure that we're not preventing things from moving forward just because we're, in essence, you know, making sure that that data governance is in place. What can we move forward with that will adapt to these new technologies coming in? We need to be agile. We need to be able to handle all the new tech technologies coming in, all of the data coming in from, from vehicles, from various data sources, um, all the companies trying to add value to that data and then sell it back to you um, with some sort of value add. How, how can that be incorporated while, while still maintaining the security of, of our clients' um, assets. So just a lot of discussion around that and a lot of um, you know, expertise trying to make sure that we can, can move forward while still putting in place that strong base um, for everything that's coming forward in the future. Fantastic. And also making sure that, that you don't do so much analysis and planning that you miss the opportunity to, to get the right tools when you need them. So that's great. Tricia, what, what is your take on on the key role that technology is playing in helping you being able to manage all of this and manage it in the future yeah what do they say don't let perfection get in the way of progress so but but laura's absolutely right like understanding um the systems of record the governance you know, making decisions because if you do if you do make those decisions like in a warehouse environment for example on the data side and you say we're going to do the common data environment and we're going to make sure that our data from our design software is designed. It's as designed. We want that footprint. We want to know that was the data at the as design point. It's very important that we don't alter that data. I just had a conversation this morning in a, in a development meeting with our software vendor to say, well, we would want to see that data and use that data, but we don't want to edit that data. So understanding the governance, where it's coming from, the system of record is really important to set the foundation. But, you know, pilots, so this 169 project that we're working on, um, the pilot project here was different than what we have at MnDOT for all the projects because it was designed by a consultant. And we had, you know, Ames Construction, WSB, they were on board right away um, to really work through Trimble, to work through the details on how this could work right. out. Now, when I look at that project and I think about we're going to actually, what are we going to do um, back in Minnesota in our normal design process? We're going to look more towards our warehouses about you know having the data contained there. But again, it, it's sometimes we just have to keep in mind that it might not be the um, ideal process. We might make mistakes. We really need to think about culture change and just um, having this work out and go through it and then saying, now we're going to do it different, maybe with our standard projects, or now we're going to maybe do it different if it's a design build project. And we'll figure those things out. But literally right now, making the connections across the life cycle, getting that done on this 169 project, showing the proof of concept has been huge for us. Um, and, and I think one thing I would say with this specific funding, because I've been thinking about this a lot, because in my day to day job, you know, I'm, we're just doing this, <laughs> like we're literally just doing it. Um, but I think we have some gaps. And so what I would really be interested in is like sort of a gap analysis of in the BIM cycle, in the life cycle, in the 3D design, where are the gaps out there? And I think there's been some research done to determine those gaps. And then in those gap areas, what I see is the training and workforce development for 3D design. 
for BIM, like really, you know, if we could use some of these funds to do more training, do more guides, workforce development, as well as just keep connecting the vendors. So we talk about the vendors in the 169 kind of stack of softwares. There's other vendors, there's VEDA, if you guys have heard of that materials management software, Ashtoware, there's other vendors, other people using other products. We just want to get um, IFC, you know, to be so more of a standard way of passing the data. Um, and then again, that change management is so important, I think, as we're walking through this and not forgetting about the people. Um, and it just takes time. It's going to take years and years and years um, to do this. And so it's great that we have funding that can support this. So Trisha, I, I don't know if you had a chance to, and if the others have had a chance to see some of the previous sessions, uh, the session with Christopher Haight and, and Dan Connery earlier on, the, the two tips that they gave towards what you're talking about, one is engaging the stakeholders and the champions early on mm -hmm. and having them be a key part of, of the decision-making so that they feel in, embedded in the process. But the second one that, that Christopher in particular was talking about was the small wins. Right, so yes, this is a multi-year rollout, and yes, there's gonna be a, a vision four or five years from now, but incremental gains and incremental releases, so you're progressively, mm -hmm. and easing them in, Trisha, like you're talking about, so the, the change management is easier to digest than, here's your new system, now, <laughs> now go use it. Yeah, um, I mean, and I just wanna to talk to that, Jamie, because I just love that, small wins. And I think about all the things that you have to do every day, like even being a software developer, being an engineer and like sometimes you want to take those slam dunks or small wins or easy you know the the low hanging fruit that will bring people along further and it's not always easy to see but it's a really good thing if you can get these small wins like i'm excited to see more usability you know certain things in software company or software solutions that will users will go wow they're really working on this they're really i mean you know that stakeholder group it, it's little things sometimes that can really bring them along. So that's great. Thank you. They heard what I said. Um, speaking <laughs> of hearing hearing what we're saying, I just want to digress this for one second. Those of you attending, I neglected to mention at the beginning, if you look at the right of your screen, you're going to see a tab called Q&A. And if you want to add any questions, we're going to do a few more minutes of closing out this question. And then we're going to open it up to any questions you have. So in the next few minutes, if you have any questions for the group, please feel free to put them in the Q&A tab. And that said, Magdi, if you wanna talk a little bit about the tech impact of technology and the ability to manage funding effectively. Yes, you know, uh, management systems like payment management, bridge management, allows agencies to make the best use of their available funds by defining kind of what's your goal. Your goal is to improve the condition or your goal is to meet a performance target or improve the level of service. And you're, but you're dealing with a constraint, which is you have, you know, a certain budget for this asset. So this allows for optimization to determine the best mix of projects, to make the best use of the funding for the agency to meet performance targets or desired levels of service. Fantastic, thank you for that. Um, and Eric, I, if you could add into that, if you have any um, additional thoughts on that. I, I think overall, uh, in a great discussion on kind of the technology piece uh, and, and the, the possibilities here in terms of digital transformation and enhanced use of technology. Um, I, I think that, uh, um, it's a, it's a massive subject. I think we've touched on different pieces of it here, uh, from uh, the comments from, from our panel here. Um, and we could probably have an hour dedicated hour session plus on that alone. Right. Um, one of the things I would, I would stress that we're, we're seeing some interest in, um, you know, have, have seen interest in over the, over the past, you know, five years or more, but, uh, but then I think with the bill and with this dedicated, um, you know, kind of potential funding, um, for, digital transformation is just that um, the, the, the notion of do I have the tools in place to really optimize how I manage my projects? Um, you know, whether I have a program of multiple projects, whether I have a bunch of individual products that are large mega projects, if you will, what have you, do I have things that help me really effectively manage that allows me to deploy a consistent approach across my organization? 
right? And set some expectations and what have you. Um, it, that also brings that that you know typically that added benefit of having more data being generated out of a single system rather than you know lots of data generated out of disparate different systems, right? I mean, you never get to the point of essentially a single system that does everything for you. It's just not tenable, right? We all know that. But I mean, the point that you get to, you have more consolidated set of tools and, and tools that provide more functions rather than individual tools for each function, provide some real benefit in terms of not only how you manage and consistently um, set expectations on, on you know, uh, performance and accountability, uh, but also the ability to kind of report rapidly and give status and, and, and you know, identify those areas that you need to manage by exception. Right, and be able to kind of flag and bring management attention to make decisions. So, so I think it, we're seeing some interest in that. Uh, I mean, again, there's been interest there for a while, but I think you know, hopefully it'll be enhanced now as the definition around this digital transformation money becomes clearer. So. Absolutely, thank you for that. <laughs> hey, Linda, I'm going to throw you a curveball. Uh oh. Absolute opposite question. What have you seen when people do not use the right technology and try to manage all this w without having the right tools? Well, that's usually when we get called in. <laughs> they tried it. They tried it first uh, without without those tools. Um, Excel is, you know, the the uh, digital hammer, right? Um, most people haven't heard, seen any problem that Excel cannot fix. But as as much as I agree that Excel is the best software tool that's ever been come up with, it can't handle everything. And so that's usually when we. Are, get called is when Excel finally cratered, um, you know, you, you can't tell which one's the most recent one. It got corrupted. You can't have uh, multiple people maybe editing at the same time. Um, and so it's really at, at the point where you see the failure is usually when there's too much volume of the stuff that needs to be done um, or, or like processes are just too complex uh, to keep track of. And I think at that point you need to graduate. You need to get a platform and it doesn't have to be a mammoth ERP. It could be, um, you know, a smaller first setup with a core set of basic functionality and you add on to it as your project or your program uh, progresses. And um, I'm a big advocate of integration. I, I like being able to pull the information that's being pulled, uh, created by the disparate systems out there, including digital twin. Um, into a, a central way to, to give management a clear indication of project and program health. And, and so I think that's your ultimate goal, right? No matter whether you have a, a single platform or you have multiple, um, you know, safe, secure uh, integration that, that uh, adds new value by combining data as, as needed. I think that's the ultimate, but you don't have to start at the ultimate. So. Um, you know, to, to answer your, your question, uh, I, we've seen plenty of, of bodies on the digital road where they tried to do it without the help they needed. And I think IIJ is going to to uh, to stress the ones who, who don't have a platform in place right now. So they have some time. They have some time now before those rules and regulations really hit. This is the time uh, that I think they need to be thinking through a plan and get a strategy. So I'm going to add a little bit to what you said because you triggered something. People use spreadsheets to manage data and it's a very valuable tool for managing data, at least a starting point. But the second you move from data to workflows, to operations, to accountability, to central documentation, to audit trails, that's when you hit the boundary with what, work, what spreadsheets can do for you. Mm -hmm. And so people, create workflows by emailing spreadsheets to each other or, you know, bookmarking yes. where they are. Yes. Um, and, and you try to somehow form a, a workflow around it that doesn't exist and eventually falls short. Yeah. So, yeah. Outlook is the poor man's uh, workflow engine. Exactly. <laughs> and you have to use air quotes when you say that, by the way, by law. Um, <laughs> so guys, we, we just hit on the end of this time. I cannot thank you enough. Eric and Linda and Maddie and Trisha and Laura, you guys, incredible, incredible contribution. Anybody has any questions, anything else you want to add before we close out? And if not, go enjoy the cup of coffee <laughs> that you've earned and we will talk next time. Thank you, everybody. Great session. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, Jamie. Bye. Bye.